Hello, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Why Decision Making is Critical to Your Organization Today, presented by Exec Online. My name is Mallory Jones, and I'm the Vice President of our Executive Service Center. So along with my team, I'm responsible for ensuring the best possible experience for you and your executive participants. I'm joined today by Chip Cleary, Exec Online's Chief Academic Officer, as well as Stephen Shacklin, Vice President of Instructional Design and the head designer of the Leading Effective Decision-Making Program. So I'll begin briefly by sharing a little bit about Exec Online. We partner with the world's leading organization to deliver world-class leadership development from the world's best business schools. We partner with Yale, MIT, Columbia, IMD, Berkeley, and Wharton, and we do so to deliver leadership development programs through our flexible and interactive virtual platform. We've worked with more, more than 200 companies and more than 10,000 leaders have completed our programs. So again, we're thrilled you could join us and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to learn more about Exec Online's latest program, Leading Effective Decision Making with Yale. Our goal is really to equip you with the information you need to better understand the program yourself and also to share the organization if ultimately you're as excited about it as we are. So to that end, in terms of our agenda uh, for the discussion, we thought we'd start by just sharing a few snippets of the content with you. So we, we'll begin with some of Professor Bracken's material around dealing with indefinite problems. And in this segment, we'll really touch on what are some of the most common difficulties and pitfalls that many decision makers deal with when they're confronted with big decisions, you know, particularly when considering today's business world and challenges. We'll then talk about some of Professor Novemsky's natural risk-taking habits. So we'll use an example from the program, and you can really see how when you reframe the problem, you get different results. And after that, we'll go through a brief overview of the new Leading Effective Decision-Making Program at Exec Online. This will include a discussion of the different modules, assignments, concepts in the course. We'll give you a brief background of the three faculty members, Professor Paul Bracken, Nathan Novemsky, Daly and Kane. And we'll also actually hear a few words from uh, Indra Noy through a, a brief video clip. You, of course, might recognize Indra as the chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, and, and she's joining the Yale faculty for this program. So finally, as we wrap up on the webinar, we'll talk about how you can get started, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, we'll open it up to some questions at the end, but feel you know, encouraged to, to submit your questions as we go, and uh, we'll do our best really to address as many of those questions as we can today, but we'll be sure to follow up with you uh, after the fact as well. So let's get started uh, with Professor Bracken's dealing with indefinite problems. And at this point, I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Chip Cleary. Hello, everybody. This is Chip Cleary. I'm really glad to be able to be here with you today. Thanks for joining. We thought we'd start out with this first content snippet to dive into one portion of the content that we cover in leading effective decision making. This will start pretty simple today, which is the question of, of what is a decision? We face lots of issues in the world. When we talk about decision making in the course, what, what do we mean by that? What's a decision? And here in the US, there's been a fair amount of business press over the past year about a specific decision that Amazon faces. Amazon's decided to open a second headquarters. Uh, and the question is, where should that be? You can see on the slide, Amazon's narrowed it down at this point to three specific choices. Uh, Austin, Atlanta, Washington, DC. And what's interesting to note is when they make their final choice, the key thing to notice is that they're going to cut off the other two possibilities. And so that gives you a sense of when we define the decision, what do we mean by that? It means not a broad issue, it means a specific choice between defined options when when you choose one option, you eliminate other possibilities. And with that in mind, it seems pretty simple, that's a decision. Um, let's now talk about what Professor Bracken shares about how leaders can make decisions. And a simple way to think about this is to think about two kinds of leaders. One kind of leader, the one on the left, is willing to help the organization move forward by making a tough call. Uh, that, you know, we're down to three choices for Amazon. Will it be Austin? Will it be DC? Uh, that leader is willing to look at the data, make the call. And by doing that, that leader enables the organization to move forward. While you do eliminate some possibilities, 
you also focus the organization's energies on the choice that you've made to move forward. That's one kind of leader. On the right-hand side, there's a leader who takes a different approach. Faced with three possibilities, that leader steps back and says, are these really the right choices for us? Are we thinking about this in the right way? Should we, in fact, open a second headquarters? Should we open more than two headquarters? Do I have enough information to make the call? And this leader does what Professor Bracken calls widen the lens, broaden the lens. That leader steps back and makes sure that the choice is being framed in the right way in the first place. Now, what's interesting to note about this is that when these two types of behavior um, are available to different leaders, they're both valuable taken at the right moment. And so in fact, these are, it's not that one of these is preferred over the right moment, it's rather that leaders in our organizations today must be able to understand when should they make the call and move ahead, when should they step back. Both are important and both can be in the same person. Um, so that's complex. You know, that part of what we cover in the program, therefore, is just how leaders can not only make decisions, but how can leaders can ensure that those decisions are ready uh, to be made in the first place, and therefore when to step back and do what we call broaden the lens. Now, this by itself is not a new issue. I mean, the question of are we tackling the right problem has a long history in the business world. You know, here you can't go wrong by looking at Peter Drucker, you know, one of perhaps the most famous management consultant over time. And even Peter Drucker focused on effectiveness, was long focused on how many times are we spending energy in our organization solving the wrong problem? You know, taking the next step for a known problem and getting a 3% improvement on it versus stepping back and solving the most important problems, even if they may be unstructured and difficult to tackle. And what Paul Bracken shares with us is not only that we should focus on problems that are important and of high consequence, but also how we can focus on those problems and how we can both frame choices and then make those choices as we move forward. So from talking with our clients, the challenge that we see in organizations today is that organizations face so many such problems where it's important to step back and frame a decision before we put our heads down and make the decision. Um, just think about your own company for a few minutes and think about some of the trends that are impacting you. You know, here are some ones that tend to impact across industries. We're all facing global competition, outsourcing, changing demographics. We're all facing innovation, often driven by new technology, new business processes. And what that means is that each of us in our organizations is facing a series of the language we use for that in this course is indefinite problems. Now, indefinite problems are one in which they're not yet framed as decisions. You know, what that means is that we need to take the effort to step back and be thoughtful about how to frame those. Um, now, what's interesting about how to uh, tackle indefinite problems is that it really means that to handle them well in our organizations, we need leaders across levels to be able to tackle these. There's so much, so many of these indefinite issues to tackle, we can't simply surface them to senior management and ask the CEO to tackle it. We really need leaders across their organizations to step back and ask, how will this impact my business? How will this impact my business, even at the level of our organization, at my department within the organization, my level within the organization? So now, with that notion that because of the business trends that Mallory mentioned up front, are causing our organizations to face so many indefinite problems. Therefore, we require leaders to be able across levels to be able to make effective decisions. Let's take a minute and just give some examples of what we mean by the, these indefinite problems. Let's look at a couple of industries. We'll look at two. The first, financial services. And while I talk through this, you can think about the extent to which the trends you, we talk about here are trends also that are affecting you in your industry. You know, in financial services, it's certainly the case that there's lots of existing issues that have been known for a long time in financial services. How do we manage risk? How do we price it? How do we set, profit, set pricing? Uh, but at the same time, there's a tremendous change driven by uh, changing financial technology. How can we transfer money to each other? How do we share the bill? Uh, all sorts of financial technology is creating chaos in terms of how financial services organizations 
relate to each other, relate to the value chain, and relate to their customers. And you know, that's just one example of an industry. Let's go forward and look at another industry, healthcare. You know, clearly, Apple Watch just came out with new healthcare features on their watch. You can see the technology is changing healthcare as well. And it's changing the value chain too for how health, uh, healthcare, the healthcare industry is working. You know, in the past year, there's been some interesting press as CVS and Aetna have joined forces, a pharmacy and an insurer, a financial services organization, and they're working together to drive actually a change in the distribution of healthcare by working to put clinics inside CVS pharmacy stores. That's a pretty dramatic change, and you can imagine inside that organization as they work together to do that the level and number of indefinite problems that are faced across the function as they figure out how to implement that service, how to price it, what value they derive from it, how to measure the impact, how to refine it over time. Now, these are just two industries. And as I mentioned, you can think about your industry and you can think about whether the fact the number of decisions and the level of definitiveness about those decisions are also changing in your organization. So, if the need that we see many organizations facing today is to be able to tackle indefinite problems, know when to step back from a decision and rethink and reframe, but also know when to go forward and how, how to do that, you know, we can think about how, how is it that when there is an indefinite problem, leaders can tackle that. And you can see on the slide a set of ways that uh, historically organizations have tackled that. If I'm a mid-level leader in an organization, I might leave it to my boss take it to my boss and let them have the uh, intuition, have, have them take the decision. You know, in the recent press, I could blink. I could uh, go with my system one thinking, let my intuition tackle it, and move on to the next thing that I have to do with my day. I could bring in an expert. I could use the wisdom of crowds. I could look in the press. I could hire a consulting company and take their decision for me. Or, you know, if, if technology pans out and the promises work, um, you know, maybe I could ask an artificial intelligence system. Ask IBM Watsons to come in and help me make the call. Now, the thing to notice about all of these different options is that these are all essentially ways for me to outsource a decision to somebody else. And in yesterday's world where it's possible for decisions to be escalated because the velocity of decisions may have been less than it is today, um, you know, that might have been an appropriate uh, approach. But the organizations that our faculty talk with today don't live in that world. They really live in the world of needing leaders across levels to be able to frame indefinite problems and tackle decisions. And that's why inside the program that we've developed with Yale, that we tackle, spend significant energy on how to frame problems as well as how to push forward with problems. So let me pause there on this dive into one snippet of the content that we have in leading effective decision making and pass it back to you, Mallory, to turn to some of Professor Nabanski's work. Yeah, wonderful. So in this program, uh, we're gonna teach your executives about risk assessments. So how to identify which are the good risks and which are the bad risks. And then once we've identified the good risks to take, how do we actually encourage ourselves or our employees to take more of those good risks? So we're gonna break this down into what are our habits when thinking about risk taking? What's our natural approach? And then how can we improve on that natural approach? So we wanna just give you a little bit of a taste of this we're going to use um, one of many examples that are, are used in the program uh, today and so to, to start to start this discussion off I want to ask you a, a simple question so imagine you're making a choice between the following two options you have either a sure gain of a thousand dollars or a 50 50 chance to gain two thousand or to gain nothing which would you take so let's launch the poll we want to know what you think again if you had a choice between a, a sure gain of a thousand or a 50 50 chance to to gain two thousand or to gain nothing and we'll leave it up for just another um just another two seconds or so okay great let's let's share the results with them Wonderful. So <laughs> this is crazy almost, but when <laughs> Professor Novinsky's team asked a large group of people just like you this question, um, believe it or not, what they found was that the vast majority, in fact, as many as 85 percent, so the same number that we're seeing here today, they actually preferred that sure gain as well. So 
Uh, now let me ask you another question. So assume that in addition to what you currently own, you've, you've just been given $2,000. You can imagine maybe you found it in a bank account. Um, maybe, you know, you have a distant relative who, who died and, and left you some money. Maybe you, um, but just somehow you have $2,000 more than you, you thought you had when you, you woke up this morning. So now you're facing this choice. You either have the option of a short loss of $1,000 or a 50-50 chance to lose $2,000 or to lose nothing. So in this case, you know, what would you choose? Again, it's either a sure loss of $1,000 or a 50-50 chance to lose $2,000 or to lose nothing. And so again, we'll leave it up for just a few more seconds here. And let, let's, go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and show them the results. So yeah, so again here you have a you have a coin flip, right? It's between two thousand or nothing. You can see the vast majority of you here um, when we we asked you this question, you, you said you know I, I want to take the risk now. I want the 50-50 chance. This is also what um, Professor Novemsky saw when he asked a similar group of people. So so again in the poll you just took in the original poll, most people they were a bit more conservative. They wanted the short gain, and in the second poll they were they were willing to take the risk. And so this is a very common pattern that. Um, we've seen across many groups of people, executives, and and many others, and and I want to unpack that a little bit further uh, for you here today. So this difference in choice between the first gamble and the second gamble, it actually becomes really interesting when we notice that these are in fact the same decision. You know, in the first situation, you were asked to choose between a short gain of a thousand and a fifty-fifty chance to win two thousand. That's the same thing as waking up with two thousand more than you thought you have and facing a sure loss of a thousand. So if you had two thousand that you didn't know about and you lose a thousand, you're a thousand dollars richer than you were when you woke up this morning. On the other hand, you know, the 50% chance to lose 2,000, well, if you have 2,000 that you didn't know about, that's a 50% a chance to be back the same wealth you had when you went to bed last night. That 50% chance to lose zero means that you're, you're ultimately you're 2,000 richer than you were when you went to bed last night. That's, again, it's exactly the same as the second choice in the first gamble, the 50% the chance to gain 2,000 or gain nothing. So what we're seeing here is that people are making a very different choice about the same gamble. And, and again, it's admittedly, it's described in, in different words. So, you know, what, what can we glean from this? What does all of this mean? How, how do we use this insight? You know, what it means is that when you're deciding whether or not it's worth it to take a risk, we're really greatly influenced by whether we think we're in a world of gains or we think we're in a world of losses. And that reference point between the two of these, it's, it's mobile. You know, if you're in a situation where you think, for example, that your, your own business needs to be more risk accepting, you know, you might frame the situation in terms of a potential loss, um, you know, when you're, you're describing that situation, probably both to yourself and as well as others in the company. So again, just a, just a, um, um, a kind of a cool example there that we wanted to share with you. Just again, a little bit of a taste of the content. You know, our hope in sharing uh, some of this program content with you is that you know you're now just as excited about the program as we are and the the companies who are participating in it. And what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Stephen Chaplin, our Vice President, Instructional Design, and and again the head designer of this program. He's going to walk through in more detail what are the objectives, the curriculum, the project work, and the faculty. And that way, you know, again, you feel equipped to, to share this information uh, back with others. Thanks a lot, Mallory. So I, I first want to talk about, you know, what, what this program is going to help uh, your participants do. And, and ultimately, it boils down to helping them get their hands around the chaos. They've got to make more and more pivotal decisions. Uh, uh, those that, that decision-making authority is, is reaching further and further down the organizational chain. Um, what what this course is going to help them do is organize all that chaos out there, and, I'm, uh, and that chaos means both the sort of constant volatility of markets and the environment, and it also means this incredible influx of information they now have access to, uh, quantitative information, qualitative information, how to organize all of that in a very quickly shifting landscape, uh, and how to systematically make decisions that prioritize the uh, business's over, overall goals. Um, they're also going to uh, 
be greater able to both identify risks, but also assess the probability of those risks in a very rational way so they can put their money on the right roulette wheel, as Professor Novemsky says. So let, let me talk a little bit about some of these sort of enabling skills that are going to help them reach that goal. Um, first of all, we talked, we've talked already talked a little bit about broadening perspective. That is, how do we use others to get out of our own heads and, and uh, understand a given issue or a given situation from multiple perspectives so we could frame it differently, so we can truly be solving for the right problem. Um, we're also going to address how to assess and balance competing interests uh, and agendas, those tough trade-off decisions. How do we, how do we um, break through that cycle of measuring pro and con with confidence and, and, and authority? Um, and also we're going to uh, uh, sidestep, sort of teach them how to sidestep the dangers of intuition, as you saw a little, you know, just moments ago. Our mind does all sorts of shortcuts. Um, to help make decisions. That's that's uh, evolutionarily what, what, what we're designed to do. Under better understanding those can help us avoid certain pitfalls in decision making. So what else are we going to teach them? Uncertainty. We already talked a little bit about this. How do they uh, uh, fill those knowledge gaps swiftly? Because we can't be an expert about everything. And these large issues sort of enter multiple, multiple domains. And even more importantly, how do we scale scale our efforts? How do they scale their efforts to such that they're not spending too much time on the small problems or too little time on those big problems? Um, and again, this issue of intelligent risk. How do we understand what not only what risks are there, but what are the best risks to put our money on? Adaptability. You know, a key factor of decision making is not simply making the decision, but structuring it in a way so that the business can pivot again as the environment changes. So we're going to teach them how to structure those decisions for stage rollout. That is not over committing right up front. Uh, also key to this is establishing an effective monitoring system. And we're going to go into something called assumption based planning, uh, which helps people plant uh, uh, what we call tripwires or or uh, 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 tripwires or, or uh, um, sorry, red flags that they can monitor for that will indicate when things are going slightly sideways or slightly different than planned so they can adjust on the fly uh, effectively and avoid any, any uh, uh, and maintain that business advantage. And of course, so undergirding all of this is uh, a little bit of what have you experienced just now, which is the science of behavioral economics. Um, Ultimately, our, our, we are designed to take certain intellectual shortcuts when we confront un, especially uncertain situations. By better understanding those shortcuts, uh, we can both recognize when they're happening and uh, introduce strategies to avoid any sort of uh, negative effects those have on our decision making. So let me give you, uh, let's step back a little bit and, and let me talk a little bit about the curriculum and how it's structured. Um, as is typical for our programs, um, each week features a series of very short bite-sized video lectures from our professors, uh, usually numbering between uh, 60 and 90 minutes. Um, uh, each of those, uh, those lectures are organized by module, which address a certain theme. Uh, and and in those, uh, within those themes, the key concepts, the key frameworks, the key tools and techniques that participants are going to apply to their assignments are introduced by our program professors. And of course, each week features a scaffolded assignment that builds towards a final presentation. And that final presentation takes the form of a real initiative they can bring back to your organization. Along the way, along this six-week, six-module journey, uh, there are a series of live virtual events with our professors, which provide participants the, uh, the opportunity to not only interact with professors, but have professors bring those, those concepts and frameworks down to earth for participants. And participants have the opportunity to ask questions about their own personal situations, their personal case projects as they develop them, and really make those connections between uh, the course concepts and how they apply them in, a, in their own real world situations. So I, I want to talk a little more about uh, the projects that participants work on. Um, for those of you who are familiar, uh, uh, who are less familiar with our, our programs, each program focuses on a personal case project. That is, instead of a canned case study, we we have participants choose a pressing issue or opportunity from your business, 
and work, use that as the basis for their coursework. So in the case of leading effective decision making, they're going to cho uh, choose a, a pressing business issue or opportunity. They're going to frame a decision around that, investigate potential options, and ultimately make a decision to address that critical issue in the form of a, of a, a concrete proposal. Um, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we expect those projects to have a sort of range of scopes to them. Again, we encourage people to choose uh, uh, issues that are critical to the business, that have a direct relationship to overall strategic goals. But within that, we'll probably see a range of, of really interesting issues and problems from the incredibly high level and strategic, such as dealing with data privacy concerns, uh, in the current environment to perhaps more tactical ones. So for example, if you're an HR, uh, senior VP of HR and your training is out of date and you need to chart a path forward to revamp that training with tremendous monetary restrictions, you know, how are you going to confront that? Are you gonna outsource, are you gonna insource? Do you have the resources to do it yourself? Are there alternative approaches that you might take? So again, from the, from the, the critical but tactical to the critical but strategic, um, there, there is a range of, of possible uh, projects that could be really beneficially produced over the course of this program. So let's um, let me do a little bit of a deeper dive into each of the program weeks and the type of work participants are doing during that week. If you look on the left hand side of this table, this first row under assignments, uh, you'll see the course is a six week course, six module course. Uh, participants have one central assignment each week. That again takes them through a six step decision making process where they'll go from issue to presentation. In week one, they're going to start thinking about first frames and reframing. As we mentioned before, people have a sort of uh, a somewhat uh, natural tendency to view an issue in, uh, through a sort of limited aperture. First thing they're going to do is sort of define that aperture, understand what they know about the situation through some environmental scanning or basically um, some light research, and then reach out to others to sort of broaden that aperture. Uh, they'll, may, they'll reach out to those within their organization, potentially beyond their organization, for their take on the issue. Then in week two, they're going to broaden that lens by synthesizing that new information, those new perspectives, into a series of, of alternate frames. Uh, different ways of seeing that problem. And in turn, they're going to leverage those to create a very broad series of potential solution options. That is, how can I address this problem or these new, uh, how can I address this issue given all the ways we now see to look at this problem? They're going to skinny down that list um, to about three or four of the most promising uh, options uh, based on which have the uh, biggest potential upside for the business. And that upside may be defined in terms of uh, increased revenue, reduced costs, increased efficiency, increased brand awareness. That would depend on the kind of issue they're addressing and the type of business that they're in. So having this short list of three to four options, they're not going to think about risk. And they're going to engage in something called scenario analysis, which is in a, a, a structured way to sort of project into the future uh, certain potential futures based on critical uncertainties. And they're going to test their options against those futures. How, is, how would this perform? How would that perform? How would this way uh, of, of, of uh, addressing the issue work out if the world worked out in this fashion? So now they've got a list of options, an understanding of the risks and inherent in those, in those options. Uh, and they're going to narrow those options even further. Uh, and here, uh, we're really going to leverage this, this, this uh, field of behavioral economics. Uh, and introduce them to a lot of the way the dangers of intuition, the dangers of relying on experts, all of the ways that we typically resort to to um, making a decision like this, choosing between multiple options that can often lead us astray. And in place of that, they're gonna they're gonna systematically define criteria for making this decision, weighting those crit criteria, um, essentially developing short form models to ensure that they are making a rational decision and aren't betrayed um, by the types of shortcuts we all take. So before, you know, they've got their, they've got their front runner, they will have narrowed in on a front runner, but before moving forward, one critical thing they have to do is do something called consider the opposite. And this is something that's often overlooked. That is, that is employing others to really stress test that, that uh, decision before uh, they move forward. 
And again, there are certain structured ways of doing that that avoid uh, the, co the common rubber stamping that goes on. Um, and that is a common pitfall in these sorts of decision-making processes. So with their decision in hand, they, again, they use something called assumption-based planning to create a uh, final presentation, which explains how they're going to introduce the solution, and also that system of, of, of uh, signposts and tripwires that they're going to monitor for to, ins to ensure that uh, you know, the assumptions that the success of that decision are holding true, and if not, that will enable them to pivot on the fly um, and, and adjust their approach for maximum, maximum success. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, your, our program professors. We're really privileged to have a sort of diverse uh, group of professors uh, from Yale, all leaders in their field. Um, Paul Bracken, who, whose background is in uh, uh, management and political science, has consulted at the highest levels of government, um, uh, often war running war games for the Pentagon. Uh, he's really our, our leader our, our, in terms of uh, assessing and dealing with risk. Uh, and making decisions under uh, high-risk circumstances. Uh, we've got Dalian Kane, a young rising star, and uh, a professor of management and marketing. He's been on National Geographic, tremendously charismatic, uh, an expert in business ethics. Um, and he's gonna tell us a lot about how to model simple decisions, again, to avoid those dang the dangers of, uh, that behavioral economics reveals. And then again, we have Nathan uh, Novemsky, uh, who comes from a marketing background, actually, in customer choice. He was a protege of uh, Daniel Kahneman, perhaps many, some of you are familiar with Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and uh, uh, he is uh, primarily in the responsible for the course for providing insights on you know, brain science. How, does, how, does, how do we make decisions and what are the pitfalls and how can we avoid those in very practical and simple ways? So in addition to our program professors, we are absolutely thrilled to have uh, Indra uh, Nui joining us. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Indra. She is the chairman and chief executive officer of PepsiCo. Uh, she is a world-renowned leader. Um, she has uh, directed their global strategy for over 10 years. Uh, uh, she was appointed CEO in two, 2006. Um, she led PepsiCo through a tremendous transition period. Um, uh, and her performance with purpose strategy um, uh, has really established her as as uh, one of the most transformative leaders of, of her generation. And uh, you know we're thrilled to have her insight and wisdom uh, as a part of this program. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Mallory Jones, who's going to tell you a little more about how Andrew will be participating in the program and uh, give us a little uh, 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 some words of wisdom from Indra herself via video. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, yes, yeah, so again, we couldn't be more excited for the role that Ms. Noy is playing in this program, really um, through a series of exclusive video discussions. She's going to take us step by step through the decision making process that actually led to that performance with purpose pledge that Stephen just mentioned. So, for example, how did she first identify the challenges confronting PepsiCo and really look at the market trend? You know, how did she then elicit multiple perspectives on the issues and start to gain buy-in from various stakeholders? You know, how did she then manage conflicting interests, conflicting priorities? How did she identify and assess uh, risks, uh, assess the rewards, right? Um, and then she she wanted to weigh the ethical considerations. And, and then finally, you know, how was she able to really evaluate her options and choose the best path forward for her organization. So, you know, uh, again, we'd like to to play a just a brief video clip here today, and um, and hear a few words of wisdom from from Andrew herself. And so, I'd say half our life is about decisions that have to be made, small and big. Uh, sometimes it may seem small for a CEO decision, but for the company, it's pretty big, because you know whatever decision we make actually cascades down the whole company. Sometimes it's a big decision because it has major consequences. But I think the thing that I would really twist this around and say, um, how often do you have to make courageous decisions? Because there are many decisions we make that's part of our life. It's the courageous decisions that require you to have enormous amounts of data coupled with instinct, coupled with observation, and then putting that all together with, can the organization implement it? When you think about all that, especially if your data is imperfect or your gut 
tells you that it's different from what the data is saying. Courageous decisions are what are major. And I'd say that's about 25% of the decisions we have to make. Wonderful. And, and again, just a tiny snippet of the, uh, the content from the program, uh, you know, that, um, that is in leading effective decision making. So, um, so let's do this. We're going to spend just another uh, kind of minute here talking about how you can get started and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So we'll begin with just key dates. Um, the welcome module is in fact already open. So from the moment that your participants register for this program, they can access the Exec Online platform. We do ask that folks register by October 5th and then orientation begins on October 12th. That's when participants will begin their, their pre-work um, with the program officially beginning on the 22nd of October and concluding on December 2nd. So again, it's a six week program in duration. And we can talk now a little bit about, uh, you know, how to get started if you're either an individual or you're an HR um, representative and, and would like to nominate, maybe you're a business leader. Um, so, so again, you can either sign up as an individual by going to execonline.com or you can nominate people through the enterprise portal by visiting enterprise.com exactonline.com. And really, if you have any questions at all, we're, we're here to help. Uh, please just contact us at enrollment at exactonline.com. And so now we'll open it up for um, Q&A. You know, we, we ask that you, you post your questions to the question box there, or, um, you know, simply you can raise your hand, you know, whatever your, your preference. And we'll, we'll take just a few minutes um, for Q&A here. So, so wonderful. So one of the questions here is around, you know, what do participants actually do with these projects after the program? That's a, a really great question. Um, I'll actually, I'll turn it over to uh, Chip Cleary to, to answer that question. Ah, good question. Yeah, and this is a question we face across our programs, and the answer for this program is the same as the answer across our programs, which is in each of our programs, LED included, our participants choose a pressing issue that represents a challenge that's meaningful for this business, uh, for their business, and by the time that they finish the program, they have a proposal ready for how they'll address that issue going forward. And what we find, in fact, is that 70% of those proposals are actually implemented um, by our participants. So that not only do they learn the skills during the program itself, but they actually create meaningful, high impact change for their organizations with their projects uh, after the program. Let me turn it back to you, Mallory. Yes, yeah, so and we actually have another question here that came through the chat. So, so what um, type of support do participants receive in this program? Again, really great question. And um, at, you know, as the head of our executive service center, I'm really pleased to answer that one, which is to say that we do provide 24-7 support to participants in our program. So they can email, call, live chat. We have uh, many different channels that we use to, again, support our executive participants. We have participants who are um, from across the globe as well. So, you know, really uh, set up to support uh, individuals, not only who are in the United States, but internationally as well. And, you know, really they can, they can reach out about anything if they need um, technical support, maybe a little help navigating the exact online platform. This could be their first online course. Um, you know, maybe it's they would like help with uh, regard to their, their project work or they've got content questions, really anything at all. You know, we really encourage um, participants to reach out to our team so that we can, you know, guide them in what is this, uh, this really fabulous journey. Uh, great, great question. So for other questions, how do we measure the impact of this program? That's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Chip and Stephen if you'd like to take that question. Sure, oh, I'll, Stephen, I'll jump in there. 
<laughs> this is Stephen. We, 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 we measure the impact on multiple fronts. Um, you know, first of all, uh, from, from a skill front, from a qualitative front, we um, assess participants' abilities related to some of the key object objectives early in the program. Uh, that's a self-assessment. And then again, at the end of the program, to sort of measure the delta in terms of uh, confidence in, in executing the key skills in the program. Um, we also uh, uh, question participants about the potential impact, both business impact and actually quantitative impact of the projects that, co that come out of the program. So we have a pretty good sense of, in real dollars and sense of, of how uh, the coursework is going to contribute back to the business. And we follow up with our alumni uh, uh, post course and, and often uh, with their their managers to confirm the, the the extent to which those projects have really contributed to uh, to the success of the business. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. And um, another question here is: Are there 2019 sessions planned? We we can't get people enrolled immediately. Yes, we will uh, run these programs on the same schedule as the. Um, the other second line programs in 2019 so we'd be happy to send you you know the 2019 calendar so you have those dates great question um, another question here is there a specific role or type of professional that this program is best suited for and chip maybe i'll turn that one over to you <laughs> sure be happy to take a turn um, the this, this program i think we find is really interesting and in that as i was mentioning with some of paul bracken's material you know, what we've heard from our clients is that they face a requirement for leaders across levels to make decisions, to take indefinite problems and convert them into decisions. Um, so uh, we actually feel that this program has quite a broad target audience. I think the question that, you know, when we've been talking with HR business partners, for example, about how to target this program is to say which groups inside your organization face indefinite problems, need to convert them into well-framed decisions, and need to be able to pursue those decisions at an appropriate pace. And sometimes that means it's a concrete decision with not necessarily lots of uncertainty or a huge impact. We should move fastly, make the call, and move forward. And sometimes, as we talked about earlier, that means, no, this is a big decision with lots of uncertainty. We need to step back and use a thoughtful process step-by-step, step, like Stephen shared with the course map here. So we see really quite a broad audience, and it really has to do with the number of indefinite problems faced at different levels within your organization. Thank you so much, Chip. And so another question we have here is, do you have a one sheet or materials on this program that I can circulate internally? A absolutely, we'll be happy to get that over to you. Um, you know, great, um, again, great question. Many of the, um, you know, what you found in the webinar today, it's consolidated into just an easy to, um, easy to share one pager. So we've got exactly what you're looking for there. Um, another question here, is it recommended to have people from the same company going through at the same or different time? Is there a benefit to one or the other and why? Perfect question. I love, I love getting this question. So, you know, as a part of the experience, we do have um, live virtual events. So these live virtual events, they are 90 minutes in duration. There are three of them in this program, and they are with the faculty as well as with one another. So what you do is you break out into cohorts, and it's typically with members of your same company, not always, but typically with members of your same company to work on breakout exercises together that ultimately are going to help uh, you to, to fuel your project forward. So, you know, we do, in fact, um, recommend, uh, again, because of that kind of shared uh, learning experience, we do, in fact, recommend that you have um, cohorts uh, from your organization that go through the program at the same time. If that didn't fully answer your question, feel free to let me know. I'd be, you know, happy to speak even further to that. Um, so, so another question here is, as I look at the dates for the program, they fall around Thanksgiving time, um, you know, can make it challenging. Uh, can you can you share anything there about, you know, program completion, target dates and and extensions for participants? 
again, um, a question I'm happy to take here. I've, I've worked with um, thousands and thousands of our participants over the course of the years. And, you know, you can imagine that things come up, whether it be work or personal. And, um, you know, we, of course, do have um, vacation schedules that we're, we're cognizant of. And so, you know, for those participants that are not able to complete on time, we're really happy, in fact, to work with them around extended completion uh, periods. And so our team is there to support them. And of course, the Exec Online platform is, is open uh, such that they can submit their assignment, you know, um, again, um, not always on the, the course completion date, but when best aligns with their schedule and we're there to, to support them um, in doing that. And so I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, and so, you know, we'll look to see if there are, are any more questions here. Feel free to submit them now. And if we didn't get to your question, we're happy to, um, happy to follow up with you after the fact as well. We'll make a, um, a list of the questions that came through. So we are at the end of our webinar today. We just, again, want to thank you so much for taking the time. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and, and we look forward to seeing your executive participants in the program. Thank you so much.